Okay, so now let's look at blood vessels, circulation, and we've kind of looked at some things, I've thrown some terms out. So this is what happens all over the body. So from the heart, you know this whole cardiac cycle. So you can see from the right ventricle through the pulmonary artery, it goes out to the lungs, so there'll be a right and a left pulmonary artery. And arteries keep getting smaller and smaller, so they have branches. As the branches get really small, they finally end up forming capillaries, which remember only have the tunica intima. So that's the arterial end of the capillary. Then the arterial end of the capillary will join up with the venous end of the capillary, so capillaries will continue. And venous end of the capillaries will join together, so small ones will form large, large ones will fill, still form larger, and they'll go towards the heart. So you can see from this that arteries go away from the heart, veins go towards the heart, right? Arteries start big and end up small. So we say they have branches. Actually, all of this is there in your notes, I think. Uh, veins start small and end big. So they end up as really large veins, like superior vena cava and inferior vena cava, and that's how those two get into the heart, or even the coronary sinus. And so at every part in the body, you can see that there are these capillary plexus, which is seen, okay? So let's take a look at this video. The circulatory system consisting of the heart, arteries, capillaries, and veins is the pumping mechanism that transports blood throughout the body. In the heart, the left ventricle contracts, pushing red blood cells into the aorta, the body's largest artery. From here, blood moves through a series of increasingly smaller arteries until it reaches a capillary, the junction between arteries and veins. Here, oxygen molecules detach from the red blood cells and slip across the capillary wall into body tissue. Now deoxygenated, blood begins its return to the heart. It passes through increasingly larger veins to eventually reach the right atrium. It enters the right ventricle, which pumps it through the pulmonary arteries into the lungs to pick up more oxygen. Oxygenated, blood re-enters the left atrium, moves into the left ventricle, and the blood's journey begins again. So this is just a review on blood vessel histology, which we did, just did. So you can see this um, tunica in media thicker in arteries, uh, externa thicker in veins. The arterial wall has a the muscle of the arterial wall has a sympathetic innervation. So this part may not be recorded. So the muscle of the arterial wall is innervated by the sympathetic nervous system. And the function of the sympathetic nervous system in most parts of the body is to constrict the arteries. So this is called vasoconstriction, vaso for blood vessel. So sympathetic nervous system is what innervates the muscle in the tunica media. Vasoconstricts in most part of parts of the body, like your skin, in the organs, that's where it vasoconstricts. But in important areas of the body, for example, your brain, coronary blood vessels, and skeletal blood vessels, the sympathetic nervous system dilates. Because what is the function of the sympathetic nervous system to help to aid you during fight or flight? So if it constricted the artery, coronary arteries, your heart would not get enough blood supply during a time of stress, and you, it would not be able to work, right? So in these areas, like the brain, important areas, brain, skeletal muscle, and coronary arteries, it vasodilates, but everywhere else it constricts. And then here you can see how it's showing you um, the various layers. And what I also want you to see that in veins, especially in the veins of the lower limb and the abdomen, because they are going from below upwards towards the heart, so they are going against gravity. 
the blood as it's flowing up since the wall is so thin the blood can kind of go back right it needn't go up it kind of just remain pool down so veins have valves present in them and these valves are present especially in veins of the lower limb and of the abdomen <coughs> so that when blood goes up this is very similar the working is very similar to the sinus in the semilunar valves so as blood goes up if it tries to come down what it does is this valve it'll kind of make it bulge like this like a cushion and the valve will close so blood will not be able to co come down so that's one a way that venous return is helped to go towards back towards the heart the presence of valves the second is most large veins always lie next to arteries so the pulsations of the arteries help the veins push blood up in the veins so that's the second thing lying next to arteries and the third is skeletal muscle activity and all of this is again more important for veins of the lower limb and the abdomen because the upper upper part of your body especially head and neck see it's so easy it comes down along gravity gravity helps it along you may have noticed that if you sit for an extremely long time especially if you go on a long flight you may have noticed that your feet begin to swell right and if you have not got up that's because a couple of reasons one is you're sitting for so long so your your thigh you know is compressed against the edge of the seat so you're kind of kinking the vein over there so venous return is impeded second because you're sitting for so long there is no skeletal muscle activity so and skeletal muscle activity is very important to kind of push pump the veins like that so it doesn't allow that to happen so that's why your blood pools in your legs when it pulls in your legs because of hydrostatic pressure it kind of flows out and your feet begin to swell and that's why your shoes begin to feel tight how do you do what no you don't do it the skeletal muscles do it the you it's not like you're doing this the your skeleton if you sit for a very long time that's why they tell you if you go for long flights uh, every hour or 45 minutes you should get up and walk a little bit so that you you cause your skeletal muscles to act if you sit for a on a six hour flight without getting up you get in at whatever the beginning of the flight and the only time you get up is uh, when you the flight ends six hours you're sitting there is no skeletal muscle activity in your lower limbs that's when I, the you know the blood will pool so here you can yeah i'm sorry did you say again you said something about um the, the blood going against gravity and the veins lying next to the arteries you said the arteries the, the, the pulsations of the arteries so if you look here let's look at this picture or he show in that video you saw so lying in all over the body there are veins which lie next to arteries arteries are pulsatile that's why they have a thick muscle wall and the pulsations of the arteries are transmitted to the veins and that pulsation helps to push the blood up in the vein so that's another factor second is this valves and third is the skeletal muscle activity the fun because these veins are lying deep inside your legs and your abdomen the skeletal muscle in your legs kind of when it acts it squeezes the veins and pushes the blood up towards the heart okay and here it shows you the diameter you don't have to remember these diameters but look at an elastic artery like the aorta and its three major branches how thick it is so also is a muscular artery then arteries when they get real a little bit small instead of calling them an artery the really small branches we call arterioles so you can see that the lumen is much smaller the artery is become smaller then it gets to a capillary where it's the thinnest and then it gets to a small venule which is the equivalent of an arteriole and then from that it becomes a vein now in many parts of the body you will see that uh, arteries and even veins but we are we usually are more wor worried about arteries arteries join each other this joining is known as anastomosis so to give you an example if you look at your so if you look at the palm of your hand you have two arteries one on the lateral side called the radial artery 
one on the medial side called the ulnar artery though one would think this is the thumb but this is the thumb okay mm -hmm. so this comes down and they actually join each other like this in the palm of the hand they form a little arch in the palm called the palmar arch so such a place where arteries join each other this is known as an anastomosis and anastomoses are seen quite commonly they are seen in the palms and soles they are seen in the brain there's a, a arterial circle in the brain which you may have done in ANP1 called <coughs> circle of willis uh, they are seen in the gastrointestinal tract and then many other important areas but these are some areas where you know typically you see these anastomoses it's important because it helps to reroute the blood supply if one part of that artery is blocked then the blood can be rerouted and we'll be looking at these uh, anastomoses and I'll point this out whenever we come to these areas okay so you must know what is the meaning of anastomosis a joining of blood vessels whether it's an artery or a vein but we usually like are more concerned about arterial anastomoses because they are typical venous anastomosis veins tend to kind of find their own uh, anastomosis so they're not always typical they kind of uh, differ from person to person mm -hmm. so if somebody yeah. gets their, their veins stripped from their leg right does it just make up it finds another way to go exactly that's a good question if uh, you know the saphenous vein which is a, a long vein which is present on the just below your skin on on your leg uh, they use that saphenous vein graft to buy for bypass surgery uh, so when they strip that vein uh, the veins, superficial veins have in the leg have connections with deeper veins. So one vein goes, there are always other connections. It will find another way to go around. Arteries, if they are blocked and if that in that area, if there is an anastomosis, it's good because it will kind of reroute itself. But in the heart, for example, anastomoses are superficial. Then you, when you go deeper down, there are not many anastomoses. The more you exercise your heart by doing regular exercise, the more you kind of stress your heart in a good way. So anastomoses open up, you know, the arteries begin to grow and capillaries begin to grow and they join each other. So that's why they say regular exercise is good. So in someone who's sedentary and if one artery is suddenly blocked in the heart, there is unlikely that there is going to be a rich anastomosis and it could prove more fatal for that person than it would for someone who's been exercising regularly. So when we look at circulation, we describe circulation under three headings. One is systemic, where it is going to the whole body other than the lungs. And all circulation will always consist of arteries and veins. Then there is pulmonary, which is circulation which goes to and comes back from the lungs. So again, arteries and veins. And then we will talk a little bit about fetal circulation, which is a little different because you have some additions in fetal circulation since the lungs are not functioning and the placenta acts as the lungs. So this is a bit different. And notice from this picture, one is that again, you can see arteries going away from the heart, breaking into capillaries, veins joining from capillaries coming towards the heart. Uh, veins are always colored in blue because most veins carry deoxygenated blood. Arteries are in red because arteries carry oxygenated blood except in the pulmonary circulation where it is switched and then we'll see even in fetal the umbilical circulation it is switched some terms uh, that i would like you to know with arteries and veins is remember i told you arteries have branches everywhere arteries have branches veins have what are known as tributaries or we also use the word drain where does this vein drain or what drains into this vein okay so let me give you an example and always try to um, you know whatever your real life situations are try to kind of correlate them with anatomy it just gets a little easier so let's take us 19 i think i said said this in the lab so but let's take, take a look again at it, okay? And we are here, so this is Almerton. So you all know that, right? 
and then from Almerton, you got various roads coming off this way. And then from here, there's another one here, okay? So I'm just going to call this Starkey and this one, I don't know, Brian Derry. So I'm talking of an artery first. So if you were to give somebody directions, and here is Seminole Campus, and you were to give somebody directions, somebody coming from up north and coming down here. So you would say, go down on US 19, turn on Almerton. So what's that? Turn right on Almerton. <laughs> turn left on Starkey. And then you will say, then turn right on Brian Derry. Right? That's how you would give them directions. So same thing, if you look at this, we would say that Almerton branches off of US 19. Right? So I would say, if I asked you, what is Almerton a branch of? You would say a branch of US 19. I would say, what or what? Which of these is a branch of US-19? Almerton, Starkey, or Brian Derry? You would say Almerton. You know, the next immediate thing. Similarly, Starkey is a branch of Almerton, or Almerton branches into Starkey, right? And Brian Derry is a branch of Starkey, or Starkey's branch is Brian Derry. Do you understand? So that's how you're going to say. So whenever you talk of branches of an artery, you've always got to say, if I ask you what are the branches of the aorta, you're going to think of what are the immediate ones which come straight off the aorta. Everything finally leads into the aorta, but we're going to talk of what immediately comes off, like this. Or I, if I ask you what is the left common carotid a branch of, you're going to see which artery does it come off of? And that's how you're going to describe it. So in your notes, you will notice that there are a bullet. So if I say aorta, that's one bullet. And then you will find, you know, it's various branches. This goes under it. And then after that, under this is something here. So this is how you're going to kind of read. This is a branch of this. This is a branch of this. Okay, so that's how you're going to read that. If you look at the images, it becomes clearer. When we look at veins, and I'm again going to use blue just because of that, and let's take the same situation up here. Almerton, and this one was Starkey, and maybe I shouldn't use the same name, but anyway, Brian Derry. Now, veins are going backwards, right? If I had to tell you from Seminole campus to go back to where your house, I would say turn here, go straight, turn here, go up, and then you reach your house, right? So now I can say that Brian Derry drains into Starkey. Do you understand? Starkey drains into Almerton, and Almerton drains into US 19. Have you followed? Or I could say, what are the tributaries of Almerton? In other words, what is it that drains into Almerton? Would be Starkey. What are the tributaries of Starkey? Brian Derry. What is a tributary of US 19? Almerton. Have you followed? So again, veins will go into the next higher level. So they'll go up that way. So make sure you kind of understand this concept and it becomes very clear. So for that, you must look at the images very, very carefully. So pulmonary circulation is to and from the lungs. It's different for, from systemic circulation because here the arteries carry deoxygenated blood and the veins carry oxygenated blood. It begins here in the left, uh, in the right ventricle, from the right ventricle through the pulmonary opening and the valve, it goes into the pulmonary trunk. This one is called the pulmonary trunk or also called the pulmonary artery. And then that divides into a left and a right pulmonary artery. Those branches go into the lung, they follow the main air tubes called bronchi and then they go and get and divide into smaller and smaller branches till they form capillaries. Those capillaries join up and they form pulmonary veins. So you have two pulmonary veins from each lung. Those two pulmonary veins open into the left atrium. So from right ventricle, pulmonary artery, lungs, pulmonary veins, left atrium. So that's the pulmonary circulation. And then from left atrium, you know that it goes into left ventricle and that's how oxygenated blood goes into the aorta. Okay. So nothing much to it. Everything in the pulmonary circulation will have the word pulmonary attached to it. The function of the pulmonary circulation is gas exchange because this deoxygenated blood is carried into the capillary. So here's the capillary and here is the alveolus or air sac of the lung. So deoxygenated blood from the arterial end goes into the 
the carbon dioxide goes into the air sac. When you breathe in oxygen, that oxygen lying in the alveoli comes into the venous end of the capillary and then that will travel and that's how it comes into the left atrium and comes back, okay? Let's look at systemic circulation. <coughs> so when you look at systemic circulation, we'll be looking at major arteries and veins in, the, in all these regions. So in this, this slide is showing you the venous part of the systemic circulation. So these are the veins from the head and neck area. So all the various veins which we'll see in the head and neck area from there, all of them finally drain into the superior vena cava, which you remember that superior vena cava drained into the right atrium of the heart. From the thoracic region up here, and we look at this, in the thoracic region we have a system of veins those veins, that system is collectively called the azygous system. And what that azygous system does is it connects the superior and inferior vena cava. So imagine here is, the, so here is the superior vena cava and this part is the inferior vena cava. So let me show it to you like this. Here is the superior vena cava, here is the inferior vena cava and here is this area here is the thoracic region. So you have these veins like this which are draining on the right and left side they drain into a major vein which is which connects the inferior with the superior vena cava like this so can you see all these veins drain into this part which is called the azygous system and then you al also know that in the heart most of the veins drain into the coronary sinus which goes into the right atrium and otherwise those anterior cardiac veins drain directly into the right atrium when we look at the abdominal region here there's a bit of a difference. From all of the abdominal organs except the gastrointestinal tract. So all of the other organs, the kidneys present in the abdomen, the abdominal wall, the suprarenal gland, um, the ovaries, all of that ovaries are more in the pelvic part of it, um, the urinary bladder, all of that abdominal pelvic. All of the veins from there go into the inferior vena cava, which takes it back into the right atrium. But from the gastrointestinal system, so up here, from the gastrointestinal system, because in the gas, what happens in the gastrointestinal system? Digestion, right? And why do you eat, why do you die, what do you do when you digest that food? New, you get nutrients out of the digested food. Those nutrients are absorbed into the blood vessels of the gastrointestinal tract, right? Now, if they went into the inferior vena cava, from the inferior vena cava, they will go into the right atrium. And then they will be pushed like everything else to all over the body. So the nutrients will go just spread out like everything else. The liver, however, is the main metabolic organ. And when you did ANP1, you should have done the, one of the things, the functions of the liver. The liver is the, is the part which takes the carbohydrate, the nutrients, the small sugars which come and it processes carbohydrates. It makes vitamins. It synthesizes fats, synthesizes proteins. And we already saw it, you know, we saw how the liver is responsible for synthesizing plasma proteins, fibrinogen, albumin. So all of this metabolic work is done by the liver. So if you're eating all these nutrients, which really are, are needed by the liver to metabolize them, wouldn't it make sense to first take this nutrient-rich blood to the liver so that it can take all its nutrients from that and then from there it can send later send it back, right? So that you kind of divert the blood. First go to the liver where it's needed and then from that you send it back to the inferior vena cava and you go up. So therefore, what happens is that in the abdominal region, from the gastrointestinal tract, the blood goes through into something known as the hepatic portal system. So all the veins will drain into this hepato hepatic portal system. From where it will go to the liver, all the nutrients will be removed. And then from the liver, hepatic veins will join with the inferior vena cava and then blood will go back as normal. Okay. So it is very similar to imagine if you had, if everything was following this route that I told you like this, to go into US 19, imagine somewhere you actually did this. So here is the liver. 
So what you did is it, you went to the liver and then you joined up here and then finally went along your way. Okay, so it's just a way of rerouting the blood so that the liver can take all the nutrients, process it and send the deoxygenated blood on. In the pelvis, you have an, a, a vein which is called the internal iliac vein. We'll see all these veins and then it drains into something called common iliac and then they go into the inferior vena cava. So this is how the venous system is arranged in <coughs> systemic circulation. For the arteries, now we're going to look at the arteries and we're going to look at them separately. So let us look at systemic arteries all the way down. So we begin with the heart, so the left ventricle. The left ventricle gives off the aorta and the aorta has three parts to it. And if I draw a line across like this, the first part is called the ascending aorta. The second part like this which is arched is called the arch of the aorta or also called aortic arch. And the third part which comes down like this is called descending thoracic where it is in the thorax when it gets into the abdomen it's called the abdominal aorta. Otherwise, very often people just refer to this whole segment which is both in the thorax and the abdomen as the descending aorta. So we have ascending, arch and descending aorta. Descending divided into a thoracic portion and an abdominal portion. Followed? Yes? And here if you look, I'm going to just show you this. So here you can see this is the ascending aorta, this is the arch of the aorta, this is the descending aorta. From the ascending aorta, you already saw, remember the coronary arteries which come off, the right and left coronary arteries. Remember we said they were branches of the aorta, they are branches of this ascending aorta. I said the uh, uh, heart was very selfish. The first arteries it gave was to itself. So it comes off from the ascending aorta. Then when we go to the arch of the aorta, this region of the heart, arch of the aorta is meant for supply of the head and neck area and the upper limb. Arteries which supply the head area are called carotids. Arteries which go to the limbs are called subclavian. So we will look at that. So don't just pay attention to what I'm saying. Arteries going to the head and neck area are called carotids. Arteries going to the limbs are called subclavian. Subclavian because the clavicle uh, is clavius and under, something under is called hypo or, or you even use the word sub subclavian below the clavicle okay so you will find carotid arteries going up into the head and neck area you will see subclavian arteries going into the upper limb so you've taken care of the head and neck and you've taken care of the upper limb so that's by the arch of the aorta then here you come to the thoracic region where you have thoracic aorta so from the thoracic aorta you will see that there'll be many branches Think of some organs which are present in the thorax other than the heart because the heart is already supplied by coronary arteries. Think of organs present in the thorax. Lungs. lungs, yes, the lungs, those pulmonary arteries are only for gas exchange. Remember, they were not pulmonary artery and vein, they were only for gas exchange. They were not actually taking oxygenated blood to lung tissue. So for the lungs, you have what are called bronchial arteries because the lungs have bronchi inside them. You also have the food pipe, right? The esophagus in the thorax. So you'll have esophageal branches. And when you did ANP1, you saw that in the, in the thoracic region between ribs, those spaces, what are those spaces called? Intercostal spaces, right? So you'll have intercostal arteries, okay? I already also told you when we were doing the heart, the heart was lying in the central area between the two lungs. What was that central area called? Mediastinum, yes, mediast so you'll see mediastinal branches in the thoracic region, okay? So can you see just by knowing which structures are lying there, you can figure out what arteries would be, would be branches of the thoracic aorta. Then you come down into the abdomen. In the abdomen, you have kid the kidney, so the artery going to the kidney would be called renal artery. You have the adrenal gland, artery going to the adrenal gland would be called the suprarenal artery because the adrenal gland is also called suprarenal gland. An artery going to the ovaries would be called ovarian. An artery going to the testes would be called testicular. If you don't know the sex of the person, you just call it gonadal artery. So the gonads, ovarian or testicular, okay? 
Um, the arteries which go to the gastrointestinal tract like the liver, the stomach, the spleen, um, uh, the small intestine, large intestine, we'll see that they are kind of branched off little, they still have uh, names like hepatic and uh, gastric and so on, but they come off a little differently. But all of these branches will come off as you can see from the abdominal aorta, okay? Then this aorta has now got to go down to the limbs. So it cannot remain single. So in order to go into the limbs and then part of the aorta has to also supply the pelvic region. So you can see this abdominal aorta when it comes down, way down into the abdomen at about the level of L4 vertebra, it divides into two branches. These branches are called common iliac because this region is related to the ileum of the hip bone. So there's a common iliac and whenever you have the word common, obviously you wouldn't use the word common unless there was something else to follow, right? Common iliac divides into internal and external iliac. So just look at this picture. We will do each one of these individually, but you can see internal iliac means it's going into the pelvic area. So it supplies the pelvic region. External iliac will travel all the way down into the lower limb where it will keep changing names. Just as US-19 at one point, after some point, US-19 changes its name and becomes something else. And then that something else becomes something. Just like a, a, a road changes names, same way this artery also changes, this main artery traveling all the way down. This here is called thoracic aorta. Here it's called abdominal aorta. Then it becomes, com this branches into common iliac. Common iliac divides into internal and external. External comes un into the uh, lower limb where it becomes femoral when it's related to the femur. Then when it goes down into the popliteal fossa, femoral changes its name and becomes popliteal because it's in relation there. Then popliteal will branch into tibial, anterior and posterior tibial. So when you look at these names, when I go over these names, try and make sense of why they are called the way they are called, okay? So, so long as you've kind of understood this main way that these arteries are, have come down, it becomes easier. So let's start first with the ascending aorta. So we're going to now look at individual branches. So when you look at the ascending aorta, the, the branches of the ascending aorta are the coronary arteries, which we just did, right? Because that was the first branch which comes off the aorta, the right and the left coronary artery. So look at this picture so you can see the coronary arteries coming off the ascending aorta. Look at this part, which is called arch of the aorta. I said it had to go to the head and neck region. You have one artery coming off, the first one, which is called brachiocephalic trunk. The word brachiocephalic, brachium means arm, cephalic means head. So that means this is an artery which is going to supply the head and neck area and the arm or the upper limb, okay? So this is called brachiocephalic trunk. So that's the first branch from the arch of the aorta. Look at the second branch labeled here left common carotid, left common carotid which will go up to the head and neck area and third branch from the arch of the aorta called left subclavian. Remember subclavian was to going to the upper limb. So these are called left common carotid, left subclavian. So what happened to the right common carotid and right subclavian? If you look at this picture carefully, you can see that the brachiocephalic trunk actually divides into a right common carotid and a right subclavian. Do you see that? You might wonder why didn't it start to begin with, start with right common carotid, right subclavian, left common carotid, left subclavian, just made, it, made your life easier, wouldn't it? This again is developmental because when arteries are beginning to develop and form in our body, they don't all just form sim very simply like this. There are many arches, arches join in some areas and then they divide. And this fact that on the right side, it actually has a common stem and then that stem divides into these two branches. Whereas on the left, the two branches come directly off the arch of the aorta is to do with how we developed, okay? So you can see this, so right, the branches of the arch of the aorta would be brachiocephalic trunk, left common carotid, left subclavian. Then we come down here to the thoracic aorta. 
So look at the thorax, you can ignore all these words up here called aortic isthmus. Look at the thoracic aorta. The lungs with their bronchi are present, so you have bronchial arteries. This is the area where mediastinum is present, so there's connective tissue in the mediastinum, so mediastinal branches. <coughs> Esophagus is present, so you get esophageal branches. You get some intercostal branches, right, posterior intercostal branches. And then the fibrous pericardium on the outside is also supplied by pericardial branches. Phrenic has to do with the diaphragm. <coughs> so in your list of arteries, I've given you only a few, so you only need to know that. But just in case you, someone wonders, what is this phrenic artery? Remember the diaphragm in ANP1, you must have done that. Diaphragm was supplied by the phrenic nerve. So anything to do with the diaphragm, we use the word phrenic. And here's the diaphragm. So can you see how the thoracic aorta can give a branch to the diaphragm like this? So that's called the superior phrenic artery. So from this picture itself, you can see what the branches are of the ascending, the arch of the aorta, and the descending thoracic part of the aorta. So this is giving you a review of what we've done so far, the ascending, the arch of the aorta, and then we'll see that we, if we call it common carotid, and you notice that the spelling is wrong. If it's common carotid, it will always divide into something. So common carotids always divide into internal and external carotid. Here in descending thoracic, you can see these are some of the branches which have, have been named. And when we come down to the abdominal aorta, we will do all of these branches. So this is kind of telling you all the branches that you're responsible for, gives you a good uh, list of these. Okay, so we are going to look at abdominal aorta. Uh, later, but let's look at some of these arteries up here in the head and neck area. So let's see the common carotid and the branches which come off from that, and then we look at how uh, in the brain, if you remember I said there was an anastomosis present, there were anastomoses were present in certain areas, the brain is one of them, so we look at that. So here, this is the arch of the aorta, here is the brachiocephalic trunk, only on the right side. And then the brachiocephalic trunk gives right, rise to a right common carotid, a right subclavian. The left common carotid, left subclavian come off directly from the arch of the aorta. Okay. Then each one of the carotids behaves in a similar fashion. So the common carotid, what it does is it travels up. It's called common carotid. It gives off no branches in the neck. And then this common carotid divides into two branches. One is called the external carotid, EC stands for external carotid, which remains on the outside. So this is the one which is going to su supply branches in the upper neck, in the face area, in the temporal region. Some of the branches of this um, external carotid are, for example, facial, superficial, temporal. There's a branch which goes into the tongue, which is called the lingual artery. I ha you have those branches listed in your notes, so make sure you take a look at them. The second branch is called internal carotid, which means it has to go inside somewhere. So this actually travels into the skull, and then we'll look at it when we come here. So this goes into the skull, and it takes part in an anastomosis which supplies the brain, and that is known as the circle of Willis. The second artery, which is the subclavian, this is destined for the lower part of the neck and then the rest of the subclavian goes into the upper limb and we'll see it in the upper limb. So it goes and supplies the entire upper limb. Some of the branches which you see in the neck are, and one major artery which you see in the neck is called the vertebral artery. When you did ANP1, if you remember, when you did the cervical vertebrae, you, you distinguished the cervical vertebrae because they had a little extra foramen present in the transverse process. Does anyone remember what that was called? Transverse foramen, right? Okay, <laughs> foramen transversarium. That foramen transversarium, so if you kind of line up all the cervical vertebrae, this is seen from the side. Notice these foramina lined up. These are the foramina transversaria or transverse foramina. So this vertebral artery passes through this foramen transversarium and then this also goes into the skull. It goes over the atlas vertebra and gets into the skull, where it will meet the internal carotid artery, okay? 
So the vertebral artery is a very important branch, as you can see, from the subclavian artery. And the subclavian gives a number of other branches. I don't want you to waste your time trying to remember them. Just know the ones which are in your notes. And then we'll follow the subclavian artery in the upper limb. So now let's look at what happens inside the skull where the internal carotid and the subclavian artery have gone in. So here is the, this part is the brain. Here is the internal carotid of one side, internal carotid of the other side. Here are the two vertebral arteries, the right and the left vertebral arteries, okay, which are branches of the subclavian. When they get into the skull and they are lying on the medulla oblongata, the two vertebral arteries join one another and they form one artery which is known as the basilar artery. So you just need to look at the picture and you can follow along. This basilar artery lies on the pons and then at the upper border of the pons it divides into two branches which you can see here which are called posterior cerebral. So we leave this there. Here is the internal carotid which is cut from of one side internal carotid of the other. Each internal carotid gives off two major branches. So I'm only showing you one side. One of these branches is called middle cerebral. And the other branch which travels up here like this is called anterior cerebral. So here's the internal carotid giving off middle cerebral and anterior cerebral. Here is the posterior cerebral which is the terminal branch which has been formed after vertebrals have joined ba and form basilar and so on and then become posterior cerebral. Now if we join them together we can get a circle, complete circle. So this middle cerebral artery is joined to the posterior cerebral by you can see a little branch up here. This branch is known as the posterior communicating branch. You should have done this when you did A and P1. It's called posterior communicating. So it joins these two. The middle cerebral and anterior cerebral are connected because this internal carotid gives off middle cerebral and then this other branch which is anterior cerebral. So this is the anterior cerebral of one side. Here's the anterior cerebral of the other side. The two anterior cerebrals are also joined by a very, very tiny branch up here which is called anterior communicating. Okay? So you can see a circle then gets formed, anterior cerebral, middle cerebral, posterior communicating, posterior cerebral, posterior cerebral of the other side, posterior communicating, middle cerebral, anterior cerebral and anterior communicating. So can you see like there's a big circle which is formed which is called the circle of Willis. This circle of Willis you can see is formed by the internal carotid and by vertebral. These are the two main branches of the internal carotid and branches of the vertebral. So this is often called the vertebrocarotid system. Okay? The two main arteries which help to form the internal carotid are the vertebral and the internal carotid. So they, these two help to form the circle of Willis. How do they help? They give off branches which I just enumerated. And those branches are joined by these communicating branches so that you get a complete circle all around. The purpose of this circle is to reroute blood in case there is a problem. So imagine if let's say the vertebral artery of this side was blocked. So that means this side should, would not normally get any blood supply but it can still get blood. This blood is going this way, it will travel this way, go around and you can see that it will come back and it will help to supply it. Okay. So this is a very important circle which is present in the uh, brain. One of the interesting things that you notice is that in the brain you or anywhere in the body whenever uh, the arterial wall or any blood vessel wall usually seen in, in an artery whenever the blood vessel wall is dilated beyond normal so the muscle kind of just out pouches such a thing is known as an aneurysm so the vessel wall has kind of just been pushed out and forms a little pouch. So instead of looking straight like this, the ve vessel kind of goes out like this. So you can see the muscle has been dilated and stretched. Such a structure is known as an aneurysm. 
this circle of willis is often the site of aneurysms and those aneurysms look like berries so they have been given a special name called berry aneurysms often when people have a blood vessel bleed in the brain which causes a stroke most of the time it is this berry aneurysm which has ruptured okay so let's look at a question like this and last time I told you how you will identify which is a question which is not a which one of these is uh, which, uh, which is how branches of the arteries are named so which of the following is an is not a branch of the common carotid artery Very good, yes. The brachiocephalic and facial are not branches of the common carotid artery. The brachiocephalic on the right side gives rise to the right common carotid and right subclavian. So the common carotid is a branch of the brachiocephalic and only the right one. And it's not the other way around. Okay, so remember that example I gave you. Facial is a branch of the external carotid, so it's not a branch of the common carotid. So we looked at the head and neck. Now let's go into the upper limb. And you know, you did A and P1. So everything that is named is based, very, you'll find is based on either the bones in that area or what that part of the body is called. So here, this artery here is the subclavian artery. So here is the brachiocephalic, dividing into right common carotid. And here is the right subclavian. This is the left common carotid, and you can see left subclavian. This subclavian artery gives off that vertebral on the right and on the left side. And then this passes under, you can see below the clavicle, that's why it's called subclavian, subclavius below the clavicle. And it passes into the upper limb. So it just changes its name, okay? So the subclavian artery, when it gets into the upper limb and in the axillary region, it just becomes the axillary artery. So it's not a branch, it's just changing the name, just like US 19 after some time gets called, okay, 34th Street, right? The axillary artery is present in the axilla, and we have certain landmarks whereby we kind of say that from here on it is subclavian, from here, here on it is axillary. You don't need to remember them now, but I'll just tell them, tell you just in, out of interest sake, the outer border of the first rib at this point, above it is subclavian, below it is axillary. You remember there was a muscle present which was called teres major in the upper limb? The, at the lower border of teres major, this axillary becomes the brachial artery. The arm is called brachium, so that's why this artery is called brachial artery. This brachial artery comes into the hollow of your elbow, which is called the cubital fossa where it divides into two branches. The lateral one is called radial, because remember the lateral side of the forearm is called radial. The medial side is called ulna. So this is, it becomes, be, divides into radial and ulna. All of these give off various branches and you don't need to remember the branches, but they will supply blood vessels there. They will supply the bone up there. The up, I mean, axillary gives branches, brachial gives branches, radial and ulna give branches. They always give branches to anything close by. And then radial and ulna come into the palm, and you can see where the two are anastomosing again. And in the palm, they form an arch, which is known as a palmar arch, because the hand is very important. It has a lot of tiny vessels, which are very important. You know, you do a lot of uh, functions with your hand, like the fact that you can grasp and you can do fine movement. So you need a very, very rich blood supply. So here you can see another anastomosis present, the palmar arch. Similarly, when you look at the sole, you'll find the plantar arch and we'll see the gastrointestinal tract as well. Here, this is the thoracic aorta. I showed you the thoracic aorta uh, previously and remember I said that intercostals called posterior intercostals were present and you can see here these branches up here are the posterior intercostals lying below the ribs in the intercostal spaces. So these are branches of the aorta just because they are shown here, that's why I labeled them, okay? 
Okay, now suppose you got a question like this. Blood flowing into the axillary artery would first continue into which artery mentioned here? Very good, brachial artery. You know, it's like you're traveling south because you're going away from the heart, right? So from the axillary, it will go into brachial, from brachial into radial and null node. Blood from subclavian goes into axillary, not the other way around. Remember, it's going away from the heart, okay? Now, so we did the head and neck, we did the upper limb. Remember, we did the thoracic aorta, and I told you all the branches that uh, the thoracic aorta um, gave off, then we, the thoracic aorta passes through the diaphragm and comes into the abdomen. When it comes into the abdomen, now it is going to supply all the abdominal organs. And what it does, and I'm just going to go back a few slides just to show you. Okay, so let's look at this picture here, okay, this one here. So here's the thoracic aorta passes through the diaphragm, there is an aperture in the diaphragm, comes into the abdomen. In the abdomen, you have the gastrointestinal tract and the gastrointestinal organs. But you also have other organs. For example, you have the kidneys, the suprarenal glands, the ovaries in the female, um, the posterior abdominal walls. So you have all of these structures. So the abdominal, this part here is called the abdominal aorta. What it does is it gives off branches from its ventral surface. That means from the front, it gives off three branches which are to supply the gastrointestinal organs. And then from the sides, it gives off branches which will supply the other organs. And then the abdominal aorta, just like subclavian artery went into the upper limb like this, abdominal aorta is the one which has to go into the pelvis and it has to go down into the lower limb, right? So you can see when it comes here, what it does is it divides into two branches called the common iliac because it's related to the iliac bone. This common iliac, just as common carotid, common iliac will divide into an internal iliac and an external iliac. The names, as the name suggests, internal will go into the pelvic area to supply all the pelvic organs. The external iliac will be on the outside and that will pass into the lower limb where it will change its name and when it comes into the thigh, it will become femoral and we will follow that, okay? So now I am going to show you these branches up here. So first we will see these branches which are for the gastrointestinal organs and there are three. So they are given off from the front. So if you are looking at the aorta from the side, suppose you are looking at the aorta from a side view and this is the anterior and posterior. You have three arteries which come off in the front and then you have arteries which will come off from either side, okay? So we are going to look at these three arteries which are going to come off from the front and then we look at the other ones. So let's look at these three what are called ventral branches. Up here. So as this aorta comes off, it gives off three branches. The first branch is known as the celiac axis or celiac trunk and this arrow is kind of pointing a little away. This arrow should be here. This is the celiac axis, okay? This one here is the celiac axis. So the arrow should, it's a little off, it should point here. So the first branch is the celiac axis. The second celiac axis, second branch is called superior mesenteric and the third branch is called inferior mesenteric. So from above downwards, celiac axis or celiac trunk, which this one is cut here, superior mesenteric, inferior mesenteric. So here is the celiac axis and as you can see from this, it goes to supply the stomach, it gives off a branch which goes to the spleen, it gives off a branch which goes to the liver and based on which organ it is supplying, notice how the branches are being named. And then it gives branches which will go to supply a part of the small intestine called the duodenum and a, a small part of the pancreas. And the arteries are named based on what they supply. You know that anything to do with the liver has the word hepatic attached to it. Anything to do with the stomach has gastric attached to it. So that's the celiac trunk. 
The superior mesenteric takes over supply of the rest of the small intestine. So where and the small intestine, when you do the um, digestive system, you can you will notice that the small intestine has three parts to it. They are called duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. These are parts of the small intestine. So going to the duodenum, the branches will be called duodenal. Going to the jejunum, they'll be called jejunal. Going to the ileum, they'll be called ileal, okay? So we already supplied part of the duodenum by this celiac trunk. Then the superior mesenteric supplies the rest of the duodenum and then it gives off jejunal branches and it gives off ileal branches. These are all cut over here because we've removed the small intestine. And then it also supplies part of the large intestine. So the branches which go to the large intestine are known as colic branches. And actually in the large intestine it sort of ends its supply at right two thirds and left one third. So the superior mesenteric supplies only till about the right two thirds. The inferior mesenteric then takes over the rest of the supply. So again it also gives off colic branches. It gives off branches to a part of the colon called the sigmoid colon and one of these sigmoid branches will go down and will continue as a rectal branch. So you can see how the entire gastrointestinal tract is supplied, okay? So celiac trunk for supply, as you can see, and you don't have to really memorize this and I don't want you to. I want you to see that it's supplying the stomach, the spleen, the liver and here you can just write part of the duodenum and a little, little bit of the pancreas. The superior mesenteric, all of these branches are jejunal and ileal. These are the ones which have been cut and then the rest of the large intestine. Inferior mesenteric on the left side, again, colic and sigmoidal branches and then they go down and become rectal. So you can see how the ga entire gastrointestinal tract has been supplied. Here are the three branches that I just described which have been cut. So this is the first one, celiac trunk. Second one, superior mesenteric, and third one, inferior mesenteric. So we cut them off. Now let's look at the branches which I said, which came off from the side. The branch which goes to the adrenal gland, this branch is called suprarenal artery. The branch which goes to the kidney, you can see, is called renal artery. Here, these are branches which will go to the ovaries or the testes, depending on whether it's a male or a female. So unisex we call them gonadal arteries because they're going to the gonads and then we have arteries which will go to the sides these are called lumbar branches lumbar arteries just in case someone was wondering what these are so these are lumbar arteries and then the abdominal aorta divides into two branches which are called the common iliacs so it ends at about l4 level becomes the common iliac Common iliac in turn gives two branches, one to go to the pelvis so that it can supply all the organs in the pelvis, which would be, pardon, no, what would be the organs in the pelvis, Your bladder, uterus in, in the uh, females, uh, uh, ovaries in the females, uh, for males they are outside the body, the testes and um, the rectum and anal canal, right? Those are all present there. So that's what these will supply. And then the external iliac, which is the larger of the arteries, that lies on the outside in relation to the anterior abdominal wall, and then we'll follow it into the lower lip. Okay, so have you followed how the whole pattern is? So here, now let's follow it further. So here is the aorta, common iliac, dividing into internal and external iliac. This external iliac passes below a ligament here called the inguinal ligament. That's where, that's the borderline. Gets into the thigh where it changes its name and becomes the femoral artery because it's related to the femur. The femoral artery then goes to the back and is relation, uh, related to the back of your knee. The back of your knee is called the popliteal fossa. So the artery just changes its name and becomes popliteal artery. Then this popliteal artery divides into two branches. One branch remains on the back of your leg, so in relation to your calf, and another branch kind of hops over and comes to the front of your leg. So unlike the upper limb where we labeled it radial and ulnar, because these are related to the front or the back of the tibia, 
we call them anterior tibial and posterior tibial so this is showing you the back posterior tibial and this is lying in the front where it's called anterior tibial the anterior tibial continues down and goes into the foot and this is the dorsum of the foot the top of your foot so this artery changes its name and becomes dorsalis pedis on the back of your calf on the calf area the posterior tibial is the one which will go into the sole where it will divide into two branches and those anastomos so just like in the palm you have a plantar arch here so another anastomosis okay so we follow that so femoral becomes popliteal popliteal divides into anterior and posterior tibial anterior tibial remains in the front and becomes dorsalis pedis posterior tibial remains at the back continues into the sole where it forms the plantar arch so that's in general the entire arterial supply veins will go backwards now towards the heart most of these veins have the same names as the arteries and they will drain into the same structures okay so you'll have an anterior posterior tibial vein which will go into popliteal vein which will go into femoral and so on so suppose you got a question like this knowing the blood supply suppose there was a blockage of the left common iliac artery which this will prevent blood from going to left common iliac artery i should have written artery up there two and three it's both left lower limb and left side of pelvis because remember the aorta gave off common iliac common iliac gave off internal and external iliac so if i block this on the left side what happens no blood is going into external iliac which is destined for the left lower limb and no blood is also going to the left side of the pelvis isn't it internal iliac is also not getting blood supply so it's both of these will be affected so do remember that yes is the common iliac end right above the internal um, iliac internal iliac yes is that where the like section is the, that branch right there is the common iliac this this part here this stem here is the common iliac it's called common right because it then it divides this part now becomes internal and then from here on this is ex, this is external this is internal got it just like common carotid the moment it divides into external and internal carotid this is external from here on this is internal right okay okay another question internal iliac would supply all of the following organs except which one very good stomach because it's not lying in the pelvis right it this supplies pelvic structure stomach is supplied by that celiac trunk this is an overview of veins like i said most of the veins will follow the arteries the branches of the arteries most of the time the names are very simil similar similar um, sometimes there may be a change like you don't have a common carotid vein um, instead you have brachiocephalic and jugular vein Uh, but most of the time they will do that and then there are a few ma major differences so let's look at this so we can see head head and neck they finally go into the internal jugular the axillary vein from the upper limb so from here it will be radial or ulnar go become brachial then become axillary axillary goes as subclavian and then internal jugular and subclavian unite and they form the brachiocephalic vein okay two brachiocephalic veins form the superior vena cava which you know opens into the right atrium so that's how superior vena cava is bringing blood from the upper from the upper limb and the upper part of, uh, of the body which is the head and neck in the thoracic region there's a system called the azygous system that's azygous vein they drain into the azygous vein which in turn goes into the superior vena cava so that's how again blood from the thoracic also goes into the superior vena cava 
from the lower limb and the pelvic region, except the gastrointestinal tract. Remember, the gastrointestinal tract, even as far as arterial supply, was a little different, right? You had only three arteries which came off. The veins which follow the arteries, they don't go into the inferior vena cava. All other veins, like renal veins, suprarenal veins, lumbar veins, and all of that, they drain into the inferior vena cava, which you know goes into the right atrium. Veins from the GI tract, these are a little different. They will drain, and I told you, I think I told you last time, the reason why veins do not go into the inferior vena cava, because the gastrointestinal tract is an area where uh, digestion occurs and then nutrition is absorbed, right? Nutrients are absorbed. You don't want to take that all those nutrients and then throw it out into the general circulation. You want it to go to the liver first because the liver is the area which metabolizes all these nutrients. It takes care of them. It'll form vitamins from the proteins. It'll form hormones from the fats. It will metabolize carbohydrates, store it, do all of that, right? So you want the liver to be the first area to get all this nutritive blood do what it has to do and then send the blood back to the heart. So therefore, from the GI tract, the veins, instead of going into the IVC directly, they drain into what is called the portal vein or this is also no, known as the hepatic portal vein. They either drain directly, as we'll see, into the portal vein or they'll drain into the splenic and superior mesenteric which form the portal vein. From the portal vein, they go to the liver where all of this is finally removed, all the nutrition. And then from the liver, hepatic veins start and hepatic veins drain into IVC and then IVC goes to the heart. Okay? So let's take a look at these. So here you can see from the head and neck area, all from the inside of the skull and the outer part of the face, the area which is supplied by the carotid arteries, internal and external, all of those drain into the internal jugular vein. And then from the upper limb, the subclavian vein comes. So on each side, both internal and subclavian will join to form the brachiocephalic vein. So there'll be a right brachiocephalic vein, there'll be a left brachiocephalic vein. So here is the right brachiocephalic, here is the left brachiocephalic. The two brachiocephalic veins join to form the superior vena cava, which you can see here, superior vena cava. This part here is the thoracic area. Thoracic has this azygous system. So you don't need to kind of remember individual names, but I've kind of highlighted them just to show you. There's an azygous vein, there's an accessory, there's a hemi. All of this goes into what is called the azygous system, and the azygous vein drains into the superior vena cava. So even from the thoracic region, you can see it's going into superior vena cava. This shows you the upper limb veins, all of them going up like this to drain into the subclavian, which joins the internal jugular and forms that brachiocephalic. Here, this is the lower part of the body. This is the inferior vena cava. And let's see what happens in the inferior vena cava. So again, from the lower limb, the veins will keep going up. So you'll, you know, you'll have dorsalis pedis, anterior tibial, posterior becoming popliteal, femoral, which becomes the external iliac vein. From the pelvic area, you'll have the internal iliac vein. Those two will join and form common iliacs. The two common iliacs, as you can see, now join together and form the inferior vena cava. So see how the inferior vena cava is formed. Remember how the superior was formed by two brachiocephalics joining? Inferior vena cava is formed by two common iliac veins joining. All of the veins other than the GI tract are draining into it. So look at this, suprarenal vein, renal veins, gonadal veins, lumbar veins, all of these are going into it. And then also make a note of this hepatic veins and we'll come to that. And you know the inferior vena cava goes into the right atrium of the heart. So you know, just going backwards. Let's look at this portal system which I just mentioned. So there are three main veins that you should be aware of. Just as the inferior vena cava was formed by the union of the two common iliacs, this portal vein, or also known as hepatic portal vein, because it's going to the liver, is formed, as you can see, by the splenic vein and the superior mesenteric vein. So splenic vein like this, superior mesenteric like this, joined together to form the portal vein. 
Notice all of these. So from the stomach, some branches go into the portal vein directly. Branches from the stomach, some of them go into the splenic vein. All these colic veins go into something called inferior mesenteric, which in turn you can see is going into the splenic vein. So all the blood from the GI tract finally drains into the portal vein. This portal vein goes into the liver where notice it's breaking up like an artery into small branches. So every cell of the liver is exposed to the nutrition. It takes all that nutrition, but the blood is still deoxygenated, right? It's got to be sent back to the heart. So then those little veins join up and they form veins called hepatic veins. And hepatic veins then drain into the inferior vena cava. So here's the IVC. So you can see blood going here like this into the liver, which breaks up. And then from the liver through the port, hepatic veins it's going into IVC so now only deoxygenated blood will go back into the right atrium of the heart okay in certain parts of the body what happens is that especially the lower end of the esophagus in the anal canal you've heard of people who have hemorrhoids right where they're bleeding for rectum there the branches of the portal vein and uh, sorry not branches let me say tributaries of the portal vein and tributaries of the inferior vena cava they join one another and that is known as portosystemic anastomosis so this is a venous anastomosis where tributaries going into the portal vein and tributaries going into the systemic circulation anastomose so let's say if this is the lower end of the esophagus this is one site where we have this so veins from here will go into the portal vein veins from the esophagus normally go into the ivc directly there is this potential channel between them. Normally, very this is the anastomosis. Normally, very little blood flows into that. You may have heard of a condition called cirrhosis, right? Cirrhosis of the liver, where somebody, who, usually people who drink a lot, their liver gets damaged. So this portal vein is finally going into the liver. So let's say someone's, someone's liver was damaged. So if the liver was damaged up here, this portal vein is trying to go to the liver, but it can't go because the liver is completely damaged. The so blood can't drain into it. So now these channels kind of open up. And so then blood will try to reroute itself and go directly to the IVC. So you can see nutritive blood now is going the way it shouldn't go, right? But what also happens is that these channels, which normally carry very little blood, now have a lot more blood. So they become extremely uh, tortuous and very thick. And that looks like very coarse veins, which you normally see on the leg. And this is why people who have cirrhosis of the liver often might vomit blood, because when they eat anything, these veins are so large and just under the epithelium, they can get scratched and the person, you know, when bleeds and they vomit blood. This happens even in the anal canal. Imagine the same thing in the anal canal is like very coarse veins in the anal canal. When feces pass through, if they kind of scratch the lining, they can open up these veins, and that's why these people pass blood in, the, in their stools, okay? Okay, what if you got a question like this? Which of the following veins does not drain into the inferior vena cava? So you should all be able to answer this because we just finished the venous drainage. Oops, okay. The correct answer is the hepatic portal vein. The common iliac veins do drain into the inferior vena cava because the two common iliacs form the inferior vena cava. The suprarenal and renal, remember, they were from the side. Everything in the abdomen goes into the inferior vena cava other than from the GI tract, right? Because GI tract goes into the hepatic portal vein. Hepatic portal vein finally drains into the liver. From the liver, new veins start, which are called hepatic veins. And hepatic veins are the ones which go into the inferior vena cava, not the hepatic portal vein. So that's why I kind of gave you both names, hepatic portal and portal vein. So that's why that's the correct answer, okay? And if you go back and look at this picture, 
you can see here look at this supra renal veins going into it renal veins going into it two common ileacs joining and draining to form the ivc all of them go into ivc except that and here it's only the hepatic veins which go here portal vein goes into the liver okay Here are the, some clinical conditions. So this is what a cirrhotic liver looks like. And when they have cirrhosis, this is where just under the epithelial lining of the stomach, if you open the stomach, you'll see under the mucosa, this is where those veins are become very tortuous and look like varicosity. So they are known as esophageal varices. See how they already look so kind of as if they could be damaged quite easily. So any small thing like, you know, you eat something which is really sharp, it can actually just tear the esophagus and these veins can get torn and you can have bleeding. Next, let's look at fetal circulation. So here are some facts which are important for you to know. Lungs are not functional. So if they are not functioning, we need something to act as a lung. The placenta acts as the lung. So you will have blood going to the placenta, blood coming out of the placenta. Remember how blood going to the lungs and blood coming out of the lungs, the artery vein relationship was changed. Same thing happens with the placenta. So veins going, uh, arteries going to the placenta carry deoxygenated blood. Veins coming out carry oxygenated, very similar to the pulmonary circulation. Because the lungs are not functional, you can read this, left atrium won't receive any blood from the lungs. So you have to have some sort of a communication between the right atrium and the left atrium so that blood can go into the left atrium otherwise imagine no blood will go into the aorta that's where we have that opening in the interatrial septum which is called foramen ovale because the lungs are not functional right ventricle cannot send blood to the lungs so when it goes into the pulmonary artery the blood can't go anywhere you need to kind of do something with that blood right you can't just let it stagnate so therefore, what you have is a little connection between the pulmonary artery and the aorta. Since it's connecting two arteries, it's called ductus arteriosus. So the blood bypasses the lungs and you'll see that some of this deoxygenated blood is now going to go into the aorta. So aorta will have kind of mixed blood. So this I already told you, acts very much like the pulmonary system. Arteries, umbilical arteries are deoxygenated, veins are ox oxygenated. Now the umbilical cord is attached to the anterior abdominal wall. And the, from the anterior abdominal wall, this vein actually goes to the liver first. So therefore, it passes through the liver. Now you don't want all that oxygenated blood in the umbilical vein to travel through the liver and get distributed just to the liver, right? So you want to bypass that. So we'll see that there is a connection called ductus venosus, which connects the portal vein to the inferior vena cava. So just like the aorta here, I said, carries both oxygenated and deoxygenated, in the fetus, the IVC also now has mixed blood. And we'll take a look at that. At birth, all these connections close off and you get the circulation that we just described. So let's take a look at this. Before we do that, let's um, look at this fetal circulation. This is quite nicely explained. We are embryos thoracic. Sequence is only superficial. Here's a newborn heart on the left. Let's take a closer look. There's the right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium, and left ventricle. The two major blood vessels are the aorta and the pulmonary artery. The pathway of blood in the newborn heart works like this. Oxygen poor blood from the body enters the right atrium, then goes to the right ventricle. From the right ventricle, the blood is pumped to the lungs, where it becomes oxygen rich. Then, the blood flows back to the heart, filling the left atrium, and from there, on to the left ventricle. The left ventricle pumps the oxygen rich blood through the aorta, which carries it to the rest of the newborn's body. You can see the fetal heart has the same basic components as the newborn heart, but there are a couple important differences.
Because the placenta is providing all of the oxygen the fetus requires, its lungs are not needed to perform this task, and therefore, much of the fetus's blood is detoured away from the lungs through two openings or connections. They are the foramen ovale, which connects the right and left atria, and the ductus arteriosus, which connects the aorta and the pulmonary artery. As blood enters the heart into the right atrium, some of the blood flows into the right ventricle, as in the newborn. But also notice that some blood flows directly into the left atrium through the foramen ovale. This blood will pass directly into the left ventricle and be pumped out to the body without ever having gone to the lungs. In addition, some of the blood that did enter the right ventricle and would normally go to the lungs never reaches the lungs. Here, let's watch. As blood is being pumped out of the right ventricle towards the lungs through the pulmonary artery, some of that blood escapes into the aorta through the ductus arteriosus, bypassing the lungs as it does. These two important connections will remain open up until the time of birth. Within 30 minutes after the baby's first breath, the ductus arteriosus will completely close and the flap of the foramen of valley will shut off like a valve. This happens because of an increase in pressure on the left side of the heart and a decrease on the right side. These changes in the heart anatomy cause the blood to flow to the lungs, which will take over their lifelong job of supplying oxygen to the body. It's incredible to think that this complex organ started off as a couple of tubes only two and a half weeks ago. So you got a good idea of what was happening. Now let's take, take a look at this in the diagrammatic form. So here is, this area here is the placenta. And so we'll begin from here. So umbilical vein brings oxygenated blood from the placenta. Umbilical arteries take deoxygenated blood to the placenta. So let's see this. So here is the umbilical vein bringing oxygenated blood from the placenta. And here, so I'm going to just skip a little bit here. And here is the four-chambered heart, right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium, left ventricle. And this gap between the two is the foramen ovale. Okay. Here is the portal vein, which like us, the portal vein is present in the fetus also. And this is the inferior vena cava. So remember how the portal vein went into the liver and kind of broke up and so on. And then hepatic veins joined and they are the ones which go into the IVC. Okay. So let's look at the picture now. So here is the IVC. Here is the portal vein. Here is the umbilical vein. So umbilical vein bringing deoxygenated, I'm sorry, bringing oxygenated blood from the placenta travels. It goes into the liver where instead of traveling all through the liver and giving oxygen only to the liver, what it does is it kind of connects the portal vein to the inferior vena cava through this channel here called ductus venosus. So it bypasses the liver. So all this oxygenated blood goes into the inferior vena cava. What does inferior vena cava normally do? It's getting blood from the rest of the lower half of the body, right? So it is also in the fetus also it's doing that it's getting blood from the lower limbs and the pelvis and abdomen so it carried it actually is also carrying deoxygenated blood now that deoxygenated mixes with this oxygenated blood so that's why you can see that the blood in the inferior vena cava which is mixed is colored red can you see that it's colored shown in red to say that it is mixed this inferior vena cava pours its blood into the right atrium. Let's look at what's happening in the right atrium as well. Blood from the superior part of the body, the head, neck, upper limb, and the thoracic region brought by the superior vena cava, that's totally deoxygenated, that pours into the right atrium. This deoxygenated blood, most of it travels into the right ventricle through the tricuspid valve. A little bit from this inferior vena cava, a little bit goes into the right ventricle. That's why they're showing the right ventricle carrying a little bit oxygenated blood. Otherwise, normally it carries only deoxygenated, right? Most of this blood in the inferior vena cava, which was mixed blood, goes through the foramen ovale and it goes into the le left atrium. From the left atrium, it goes into the left ventricle. From the left ventricle, it goes into the aorta and the aorta divides into three branches. So look at the colors that you're seeing here. High degree of oxygenation comes here, comes down, goes into the aorta. So the head and neck and the upper limbs 
get a good deal of oxygenated blood, which is why in the fetus, the head usually grows. You know, when a baby is born, the head is usually bigger than uh, in ratio compared to the rest of the body. Now let's look at this one, where it carried a lot of deoxygenated blood, some oxygenated blood from the IVC. And actually, you'll be surprised, in the inferior vena cava, the blood really flows in two streams, the oxygenated part in one stream and the deoxygenated in one stream. And it's the oxygenated which really goes into this chamber like this. So anyway, in the right ventricle, now we have a, a mixture, but the deoxygenation is much more. That's why the color is just pink, not deep red. This goes into the pulmonary artery. And connecting the pulmonary artery, the main trunk or even the left pulmonary artery to the aorta is this ductus arteriosus. Because when it goes to the uh, lungs, it can't go any further. Lungs are not functional. So now all this blood goes into the aorta. But this is after, as you can see, after the subclavian is given off. So that means it goes into the thoracic aorta. So it goes into the thoracic aorta. So therefore, because this is more deoxygenated, notice the color difference between the upper part of the aorta and the lower part of the aorta, getting more deoxygenated blood. That's why I said the head grows much more than the lower part of the body in the fetus. This travels down in the aorta. Aorta gives off all its branches. It divides into common iliacs, which divide into external and internal iliacs. Coming off from the internal iliacs, from one of their branches is the umbilical artery. This umbilical artery, you can see, is carrying comparatively deoxygenated blood as compared to the umbilical vein. This is the one which will go to the placenta. Blood will get oxygenated and it will come back up here. Okay? When the fetus is born, you tie off this. So nothing, nothing can go to the placenta, nothing can come back from the placenta. The baby cries, the lungs become functional. So... Nothing is coming from here, so therefore the IVC will carry regular blood, okay, no mixed blood. And so it will come from the right atrium into the right ventricle, go into the pulmonary artery, go into the lungs. From the lungs, it will come through the pulmonary veins into the left atrium. The pressure builds up in the left atrium. It closes that foramen ovale. So therefore, no mixing of blood between right and left side. First breath. That's why we always make sure the baby cries. You know, you give them a thing so that the lungs open up. The idea is because the lungs are closed, the alveoli are not open. By crying, it opens the alveoli and so blood can actually go. Resistance decreases and blood goes into it. Okay? And it's not only one cry, right? They keep crying yeah. so the thing goes on. So then it comes into the left ventricle, goes into the aorta. Since the pulmonary artery and lungs are functional, you don't need this ductus arteriosus. That closes off and it becomes an of just a fibrosed cord which we call ligamentum arteriosum. This foramen ovale closes off and it's called fossa ovalis. And you saw in the right atrium, remember that depression which you saw, that's because it closed off. And this is because, as I said, it closes because the left atrial pressure increases. Up here, that ductus venosus will also close off because if umbilical vein is not there, what do you need the duct? So that becomes the ligamentum venosum. All of these veins actually become fibrosed and in the in us, if you were to do abdominal surgery, you can actually see these fibrous cords as remnants. So do you understand how the fetal circulation is? In children, remember when we did congenital heart disease, I said that if there was a septal defect in the atrium, it's because of this foramen ovale, which is not closed. Sometimes it might happen. The foramen is either too big or it's not grown enough so that the two flaps can close against each other. So then you might have an open foramen ovale. Usually you wait for a year for it to close. If it doesn't, you have to put a graft and actually artificially close it, okay? Like I said, it's developmental. It's just not formed properly. The septa are not lying against each other. They're too short. Or maybe the closure, there's a tiny hole. That hole will close with time. So that's why we always wait for a year. So that's...